And then we'll move on to myself and then it will be Owen. And then at the end, we'll have opportunity there for Q&A. Um, Caroline, would you like to start? Just let me know when you want me to move the screen. Thanks, Paula, if you just move on now. Hi, everybody. What I wanted to do was just to give you a quick rundown about the, the opportunity that they, you're joining the SPD process for today uh, and interest of. A little bit of detail about the historical approaches that Edinburgh have had to care at home. So, like very many local authorities throughout Scotland and the UK, lots of variations in the types of commissioning models that, that we've, we've tendered for at the moment. So, Edinburgh is aimed to deliver a care at home service which meets the needs of our adult population through payment by minute, hourly rates, block contracts, tiered rates linked to sustainable growth targets, crisis led contracting when capacity has been limited, engagement with large amounts of providers or smaller amounts of providers on geographical basis or non geographical basis. So last tender was there was a neighbourhood contract. And also contracts that require providers to pick up all of the referrals in their neighbourhood or to subcontract if, if they're unable to do that within their own resources. What this left us with is a, is a legacy and quite a complex landscape in Edinburgh. We are currently working with 48 different care at home providers and also 53 care and support providers to, to deliver all the care at home and care and support needs in Edinburgh. But despite all of this, it's still not working. The, the capacity that we require in Edinburgh still isn't there for individuals and we've got a significant unmet need and people delayed in hospital. So what we've been doing over the last couple of years is working with groups and providers to, to, to look at the way forward and how we'll maybe do this a little bit differently in a way that's sustainable and viable for, for all stakeholders, so yourselves as providers, the people and their families being supported, and also Edinburgh Health and Social Care Partnership. Well, I can just move on, please. I think there's a general acknowledgement and consensus across the sector in Edinburgh, and probably not just Edinburgh, it will be UK-wide, that current arrangements don't support doesn't support the delivery of outcome focused, flexible person centred services. It doesn't support integration and collaborative relationships across the health and social care centre. It doesn't put the individual at the centre of the support networks that wrap around them. They tend to work very individually in little silos and, and, and not necessarily holistically ac across all services within Edinburgh. We don't have a single oversight of our performance and communication for sharing best practice and quality and service shares the experience between all of us as we sit across the sector and doesn't necessarily support a sustainable, viable, quality driven platform for our providers. Oh. Just a little bit of high level information. So at February 2022, we've got 48 providers, as we said, who are commissioned in Edinburgh to deliver care at home services under SDS option three. So we'll specifically split this in, in terms of care at home and care and support in the traditional way that, that, that people expect that to be. And we have four localities within Edinburgh. And what we've got is North East with 27 providers, North West with 29 providers, South East have 30 providers and South West have 38 providers. So there is some overlap in the providers across the locality. And um, so 48 in total with a variety of them working across multiple localities. Volume of packages you can see there in each of the localities. Um, but we're supporting 2,997 packages for care at home, and that's across all adults. Predominantly, the last contract was for older adults, but about 25% of what the current providers deliver is to adults who are under age 65, and that's the commission hours that are there currently for each of the localities. Um, this doesn't include the current unmet need level that that, that would include from that. So. Currently, we're sitting about 10,000 hours of unmet need across the city as well on top of this. Well, can we move on, please? You can see that, as we said at the beginning, a very complex situation within Edinburgh in terms of providers, multiple providers, lots of small providers, and very few large providers within Edinburgh. So this just lets you see the breakdown in terms of how many individuals under SDS option three each provider is, is providing within all of the four localities within Edinburgh. Oh. Key priorities for the new contract. So a number of key priorities, none of which will, will come as any surprise to, to, to most of you sitting here, which will guide the planning and delivery in the way that we co-produce this moving forward with yourselves. So six broad areas, tackling inequalities, prevention and early intervention, person-centered care, providing the right care in the right place at the right time, making best use of capacity across our systems, 
and managing our resources effectively. From those approaches and from the co-production work that we've done in the last two years to date with groups of providers and stakeholders in terms of service users and, and unpaid carers, um, one Edinburgh principle has been proposed, so it's a holistic approach to commissioning and there's four perspectives to this. So Edinburgh Health and Social Care Partnership have adopted a three conversations approach to, to supporting people to get the care that they require. Um, and that is a holistic approach, which is not just about the traditional forms of, of care that we'd be looking at. It's working with, with our third sector and our independence across Edinburgh to establish what best meets the individual's outcomes, whether that is formal care at home, or whether that's other services that we can bring into that. But that's our, our ambition is that we start conversation one, which is seeing what the individual has for themselves, what their outcomes are, how this can be met, and whether there's any other assets and community involvement. That, that's required before we get to conversation three, which is looking at a very formal structure around care at home services. We've got the Edinburgh Pact, which links into our three conversations, which is that, that very community-based involvement. So making sure that, that we're creative with what we can, can offer to individuals and that it always puts them and their unpaid carers at the centre of any solutions that, that we're agreeing to come to. We also have the One Edinburgh Charter, which will be based on this contract, and what we're asking for is all the providers who are eventually tendered and awarded the, the, the care at home contract work together under the one end of the charter that they agree together about strong, reliable partnerships, standards of care, ending the postcode lottery for, for people who require support in Edinburgh. Across Edinburgh, we've got multiple areas where there's maybe more provision than we need, but we've got other areas where there, there's a dearth of provision. So we, we, we need to be working out how we we, we, we produce partnerships that meet all the need across Edinburgh and not in just, just preferred areas. And it's a unified approach that's centrally monitored. Over, over the last two years, the work that we've done together has been looking at partnership models. So previous contracts have always been awarded to individual organisations on a time and task delivery model for Edinburgh's care at home services. This time round, we're not seeking individual provider bids. We're looking for collaborative partnership tenders for delivery of an outcome focused model. Um, we believe that the partnerships and that shift away from competitive models of the past will support sustainable, transparent, equitable and viable home-based support arrangements for Edinburgh Health and Social Care Partnership for the providers that, that we contract with and also the citizens of Edinburgh. We recognise that this is, is quite a change from the way that, that we've tendered for this type of service in the past and for the way that we, we look for providers to work together moving forward. And it involves risks as well as benefits and the shared accountability will be crucial as we move forward with this model. So in terms of the partnership model, what we're proposing just now is, is that, that One Edinburgh, this is phase one of One Edinburgh, um, this will be a learning contract. We will work through through this with the providers who are who are awarded the, the contract. And with all our, our learning and our best practice, we will start to move into other phases of commission as, as we move forward over time. So this is for home-based support only. It's our care at home support under STS option three. It's where individuals who require support have no organisational specialism identified as required, so they don't need a learning disability specialist provider or mental health provider that their needs can equally be met by with the providers who, who tender for this contract. As I said, significant co-production has already take place, taken place and this will continue after the SPD qualifying process with the providers who look to move forward to, to, to formal tender submission. Mm -hmm. In designing the service specification, the terms and conditioning. Um, current completed co production to date has indicated that the preference is for a geographical type contract, so currently split into locality levels, so four localities in Edinburgh. And um, providers have felt that this supports the logistical challenges, that they can create geographical efficiencies and it reduces and increases their, their, their capacity. That is community focused. The provision will be on the partnership model, as we've always alluded to, 
the possible outcomes which has to be agreed between yourselves as collaborative providers as you move forward with this process could be that it's a lead organisation with, with partners below that. And it's likely to be block contracts, um, which we see as increasing your financial autonomy for your, the partners, but also about the way that you work with the individuals being able to shift from that prescribed time, time and task model that's currently in place to that flexible outcome focused approach. So it's about passing control over to yourselves as providers and the individuals that you support. Okay. Thanks, Caroline. So now we're moving on to why are we using a flexible purchasing system? And you know, it might seem a bit different in comparison to the information that we've currently provided you with with regards to partnership agreements. So a dynamic purchasing system is just um, a procedure um, available for contracts for work, services, and goods commonly available in the market. But this is a light touch. Um, contract as in it it's, um, has is a health and social care type contract. So we can basically design anything that we want, which works for all of us. So what we're hoping to do is use the, the DPS as a procurement tool. So it will be similar to a database so that we can collect all the all of your information together, all interested people, um, and ensure that they meet the, the correct criteria so that we can further co-produce this and that everybody in the, in the room will be on the same page. The main thing that we want to complete and uh, not only provide a service that is right for the um, carers and the Edinburgh citizens is that we need to build that capacity. So the flex flexible purchasing system should be able to build this. Um, we are talking about a 10 year contract for, for what we know at this very moment in time, um, not to leading to um, Scottish government's national care system. It, you know, we're, we're unsure of, of what will actually happen um, at that point, but um, we're hoping that whatever we put in place will be a long term contract. The flexible purchasing system should give flexible timelines as well. We should be able to open it at any point. So, for example, if partners decide that they um, find that this is no longer viable anymore or um, learning from lessons in the past, we are saying that we may need additional partners throughout the process, then we will be able to open this flexible purchasing system again um, and, uh, and to, new, to new partners. We'll also be able to add different lots. So at this very moment in time, we are um, we're concentrating fully on home-based care. But as we shift and we move um, and learn over the next few years, we should be able to then add different um, requirements such as specialist care, um, the ISF requirement, things like that. So it'll all be held in the one database. Um, so hopefully, the, the, the hopefully the we main area that we will be moving towards as part of this process will be a locality partnership agreement and that should be the outcome um, this stage. So step one, how do we apply? So the council will publish the contract notice on public contract Scotland either at the end of this week or the beginning of next. So providers will complete and submit the documents required. In April, um, the council will review all the documentation and clarify if needed. The council will complete the financial assessments and capacity and all due diligence on the submissions. So hopefully by May, we will have all successful providers notified and you will be invited to co-production events. We are envisioning that this will take, this will be over the, the course of one month and will be quite intense. So at that point, we will be co-developing with you what the specification will look like, what the pricing schedules will look like, what the model will look like in total. So by June 2022, we're hoping that we will open 
the tender procedure, the second step, second tender procedure for those locality partnership models. This will be open for about 65 days. So we're not expecting and we're hoping that networks, etc., will be built upon through April, May, June. So that it will not come as a surprise when when you know all the work that we've completed um to to that date will then um should hopefully come together um for you to be able to su submit your locality partnership submission. So by August 2022, we will be evaluating the submissions and there might be further due diligence required and maybe some further um, negotiation required. But hopefully by the end of September 2022, we'll be able to move to FNR approval and contracts award for the 3rd of April in 23. At this stage, all that we wanted to, to prepare you for was the PCST and the SPD and what that will look like. So the instructions, we will supply an instruction for the single procurement document and SPD, and that's for information only. What we'll be asking you to complete is an indication of capacity. And by capacity, we mean that we understand that you also have may have other areas such as um, ISFs, um, private um, agreements, etc. And those should not be included within your capacity submission. We would be asking you to indicate, indicate at that stage which lot you are interested in and also what software you have invested in. We will be asking you to complete a financial capacity questionnaire because we understand that at this time of the year, you'll be doing your accounts, they will not be submitted yet. Um, so we'll be asking you to, to provide some form of cash flow evidence as well, just so that we can check to ensure that we will be contracting with stable providers. We'll also be requiring care inspector gradings, um, also insurances. And we may ask for policy information such as PBG and health and safety um, information as part of this process. What does a single procurement document actually do? Okay, it needs to be, this needs to be completed per provider. For those who have tendered before, this used to be the European single procurement document. So it's mostly an electronic form. Um, and we will try and automate as much as we possibly can through that process, i.e. it will be a yes or a, a, or a no tick box um, to ensure that mandatory um, standards are met. And there will also be documents which will be required to be uploaded. I think at this stage, this is now where um, I can move on to Owen. So he'll take you through all of the, what it looks like and give you a brief overview of where to find further information. 